everyone. My name is Dylan Hosier from ICANN, the Israeli American Civic Action Network. I want to thank you for joining us for our special Tisha B'Av program, Destruction of Life, Destruction of Truth, where we'll explore contemporary Holocaust distortion and denial. Uh, tonight, joining me as co host is Rabbi Denise Seger from Congregation Kolomi, along with Rabbi Max Chaikin, Mayor of West Hollywood, Lindsay P. Horvath, and our special speakers, Grant Goshen and Sylvia Fulte. Uh, for now, I'll hand it off to you, Rabbi Edgar, to share some thoughts about tonight's special mm -hmm. project. Thank you so much, Dylan. Welcome, everybody. We're so pleased that you're here with us to uh, observe this uh, sacred moment in the Jewish calendar. It is the 9th of Av, Tisha B'Av. It is the National Jewish Day of Mourning, where we remember the times in Jewish history when uh, the Jewish people were tr under tragic circumstances, particularly the destruction of Solomon's temple, the first temple in 586 by the Babylonians, and then in the year 70 CE by the Romans. And many tragic moments have happened to the Jewish people on this date, including the Spanish Inquisition, the start of World War I, and in many, many times in the Jewish world, we do remember uh, the horrors of the Shoah, the horrors of the Holocaust. And so tonight we're honored that Mayor Lindsay Horvath from the city of West Hollywood is with us to offer us words of consolation, comfort, and inspiration. Mayor. Thank you so much, Rabbi. It's an honor to be with you all tonight and uh, always to be in the presence of the great work that's done by Congregation Kolami as well as I can. And I thank you for the invitation to join you. Um, as you said tonight, we remember the destruction of the temple and in thinking about that in the context of all we're experiencing in, uh, in our country today and in society today, I was called to think about uh, the concept of accountability. And as a mayor, as you might imagine, I might have a, a unique understanding of accountability. Many times people think of mayors holding people accountable to laws um, or Perhaps you think about holding me accountable to the things that you want to see happening in your community. Um, but as a community, and especially a community of believers, um, thinking about what does accountability mean in that context, um, and how do we hold ourselves accountable uh, to one another and to the values that we uphold and uh, that we um, have guiding our lives each and every day. How do we hold space to remember our past um, so we are accountable to not repeating it? And how do we live in community with people we want to hold accountable um, without living in anger or vengeance or resentment um, towards one another? And more importantly, how do we live in community with people uh, so we're able to build the community uh, that we're proud of and uh, that we wish to be a part of, the community that we wish to see and to build in the world. Um, and so uh, that's what tonight's conversation is all about. And uh, you'll hear from uh, the two special guests you have tonight. And I'm so excited for this conversation. Um, Sylvia in particular, uh, we wanna thank you for your work. And I know the city has honored her uh, for the work and leadership that she has done, but both of you have um, done such incredible and important work to not only hold us accountable to our past, but to create a new path of opportunity uh, in creating our future together and making sure that we never forget um, the horrors and the tragedies that have uh, been committed in the past, uh, but to uh, building anew and creating community that supports and uplifts and is life-giving. And so thank you all for having me tonight. And I'll now turn it over uh, back to the rabbi thank you thank you mayor so much for being with us and for your continual work uh, that we all do together to strengthen our city and strengthen our neighbor neighborly ties with one another we appreciate all you do friends tonight as we uh enter our program and begin to under try to remember uh how we can tell the truth even in the face of tragedy uh, we take time to remember the words sung by uh, those who were in the ghettos and the camps, words of Jewish tradition, anima amin, the words of Maimonides, I believe with perfect faith in the coming of the messianic time. Rabbi Chinkin. 
The words resonate beautifully with what you shared with us, Mayor, this idea that we can be builders because in our reform tradition, we think of the Mashiach of the Messianic time is a time that we all have to help bring about by telling the truth and helping sure make sure that we live our value of never again. We are helping to bring that about. We are acting on our belief. We'll sing one more time. And if you know the melody, I hope you'll sing along with me at home. <laughs> It's traditional on Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, to give voice to our sadness, to give voice to the pain. And uh, before we have a empowering conversation with Sylvia and Grant about the scourge of Holocaust denial and the ways in which we can empower one another to, as Mayor Horvath said, to hold governments accountable for the atrocities of the past, we give voice now with a more modern version of a keynote, a more modern version of uh, the pain and anguish. And this was written by colleagues of uh, Rabbi Jenkins and I, Rabbi Benjamin Goldberg and Daniel Olson, uh, to talk about the tragedy of the times that we're living in uh, with epidemics and pandemics and the sadness of the lack of truth that continues to abound in our world. Wail, O Zion, and her cities as Torah's trapped in all of its arcs and likes its scroll left alone unread, each letter distant from her thirsty ones. For the mourners of her families held back from her graves, and for the stricken nursing homes, spreaders of her diseases. For the great ones of her Torah, their wisdom was lost from her learners, and for their blood that was spattered during intubation of her hospitalized ones. For the breath of her babes, which was silenced in her schoolhouses, and for committees that distributed her ventilators. For the elders of her community separated from the ones who visit, and for the sick ones who pray that they won't join her dead. For the troubles of her parents who take care of her children all day, and for the arrogance of her consumers who rush her opening. For brides who canceled weddings, her joys, and for the nights out in the city missing from her calendars. For the closed and empty summer camps without the revelries of her campers, and for the infecting virus, the source of all these troubles of hers. For the sharp, senseless hatred that strikes her marginalized ones, and for the essential workers who endangered themselves for her safety. For her laid off workers who hunger for her bread, and for the PPE not found with her healer. For the voices of her scorners at the time of her increasing dead bodies, and for social distancing and the loneliness of her people. For the mistakes with the tests, they prolong her suffering, and for the prayers of her minions that were silenced in her prayer halls. Wail, O Zion and her cities, as Torah trapped in all of its arcs, and like its scroll left alone, unread, each letter distant from her thirsty ones. Together we say amen. And now let us uh, turn the, our program back to uh, Dylan Hosier from ICANN who's going to uh, introduce our speakers and share words, uh, hear their words of inspiration.
Okay, thank, thank you, Rabbi Edgar, and thank you, Rabbi Jacob. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, bring in Grant Goshen and Sylvia Forti. Um, so again, thank you, Rabbi, for that, that uh, amazing kickoff to this uh, important event uh, this evening. Um, tonight, we are going to speak about a story that is really so compelling. Um, and this is our, uh, I believe it's our second event um, in an ongoing series that we're hosting. Um, so Grant and Sylvia, before we get started um, and uh, hear more from you, I want to thank you for being here tonight. Um, and, and again, Sylvia, I, I thank you um, especially for having um, the, the courage and tenacity to continue the work that you're doing. Um, but before we dive into your respective stories, uh, maybe you can um, give greetings and say hello to the audience and um, tell us a little bit about yourselves. Uh, Grant, go ahead. Dylan, thank you. Rabbi, thank you as always. Um, Maya, thank you. Um, Sylvia, it's great to see you. Um, I think most people watching now uh, know me. Um, I'm a family man. Um, I am Jewish. I'm gay. I'm American. I'm South African. I'm Lithuanian. Um, I'm multiple identities. But my core identity is as a living, breathing Jew. And this is what drives me and motivates me and holds me accountable. Um, Sylvia? Thank you, Grant. Uh, thank you, Rabbi Denise, for inviting us and hosting us. Um, Dylan, it's great to see you as well. And Mayor, thank you for your lovely introduction. Um, my name is Sylvia Fodi. I'm in Chicago. I am a high school English teacher. Before that, I was a journalist for about 20 years. Uh, I'm a mother and uh, I am a practicing Catholic. And I'm delighted to be here to tell you the story of what I discovered about my grandfather, Jonas Mareka in Lithuania. Great, so, so as we've done uh, in the past and in previous events, um, we'll try to keep this conversational and um, we'll keep it uh, uh, fast paced. Uh, for those of you watching, we have a, a good sizable number watching uh, live now on Facebook and YouTube. Um, go ahead and post questions um, in the comment section or comments in the comment section if you like. Um, and we'll go ahead and, and take those as they come in. Um, but Grant, why don't you um, kick us off and, and get us started. Tell us okay. a, a, a little bit about how you began your research um, as a South African, researching in um, your, your family's history from Lithuania. Um, how, how did you get started with all of this? Okay, well, interestingly enough, Sylvia's and my family comes from pretty much the same village. A um, hundred years ago, her great-grandfather must have met my great-grandfather in the market. Um, the kids must have grown up in similar circumstances and similar, the, the families, our two families have been connected for over a hundred years. Um, and it's remarkable how that connection comes back into play today. So my family came from Lithuania and as Rabbi Egger will be able to tell you, uh, I've been fascinated for since I was a child uh, about the family history. Uh, history as a general subject is, is my hobby. And I went to Lithuania many times. I've restored many cemeteries there. I've been politically active, socially active, Jewish active. And one day I was in my grandfather's village and we were standing over the death pits. Um, non-Jewish historian, and I, I said I, I said to her, who murdered my families? I mean, they, they, we, we trace back through, through the genealogy, we trace back at least a hundred people that, that must be in these death pits. And it wasn't an order that came from Germany because the, the Holocaust in Lithuania had been completed before Germany started their Holocaust. Uh, so, 
I said, who, who pulled the trigger? Who rounded them up? Who shoved them into these pits and murdered them from the oldest to the newborn babies? And the academic looked at me and she said, it was a man by the name of Jonas Noreka. The name was, was meaningless to me. So I came back to the United States and I started researching the name and the, the, the first trace that I could find on him was an article in Der Spiegel magazine in Germany in 1984 that identified him as the perpetrator. Now, 1984 was six years before Lithuania regained freedom from the Soviet Union. And so the data was public, the data was known, the data was known to, to the Lithuanians as well that this murderer was Jonas Noreka. And so I, I kept thinking, okay, what, what motivates a human being to go and murder their neighbor? Because the Jews live together. I mean, Sylvia's family, my family, we, we live, they could have been next door neighbors. What makes one neighbor go and grab their next door neighbor's child and murder them? So I started researching and very interesting information. And then I discovered that Jonas Noreka is considered one of Lithuania's primary heroes. And I thought, this is just not possible. Um, I mean, it's so widely known that he's this perpetrator. How could it ever be that a country considers somebody that was a mass genocidal murderer of, of other Lithuanians? Because even if we were Jews, we were Lithuanians. We'd, we'd been there for 700 years. Um, just as, as we're all Americans, uh, whether we're Jewish Americans or Catholic Americans, we're Americans. The Jews in Lithuania had been there for 700 years. We were Lithuanians. So I thought, how could it be that the Lithuanian government would make a hero out of somebody that had murdered thousands of other Lithuanians before the mass murders had even started? So I thought, you know what? It's a mistake. Um, and then I thought, okay, if I just approach them and tell them, look, guys, you've, you've made this horrible mistake. Um, you may want to know about it on the quiet and clean it up and take care of this and sweep it under the rug. And nobody needs to know that you mistakenly made a hero of him. Just remove the hero status. And I was stonewalled. And years and years of stonewalling. And... I started, it took me a long time to realize there's something really, really wrong over here. This isn't a mistake. They know about this. They're doing it deliberately. And um, there's, there's something very wrong. So it's a very long story over many, many, many years. Uh, I, I came to the conclusion that there was no way that there was no way to, to resolve this. So I thought, okay, the government won't, I, I appeal to the president and the prime minister and the parliament and the ombudsman. Uh, wait, Dylan, is there feedback? Uh, oh. I, keep, I think we're okay, right? Okay, so I, I appeal to the president and, and the prime minister and the parliament and the ombudsman of the parliament and the heritage department and the mayor of the capital city and, you know, just multiple, multiple uh, government entities. And it was just universal stonewalling. So I thought, you know what, these people are all lying. The only way that I'm going to get this resolved is if I bring very crystal clear documented facts in front of an independent, impartial, intelligent judge that's going to look at this documentary evidence, uh, eyewitness testimony, and say, what's going on here? Of course you need to revoke these honors. And just so, just so I can ask, what, what year is this? Um, 
I started I started on on Noreka in about 2011. Isn't it? Okay. So I think my first lawsuit on this was probably 2016. I'd given up trying to 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 get this resolved quietly through government channels. So I sued the government. And it got thrown out of court. And one of the government's positions was that they had a couple of very interesting positions. They said that I wasn't personally damaged by rewriting of history. So I had no standing to sue. They also said if they had to revise the facts as they had them, it was too expensive to reprint history textbooks. Um, they came up with these remarkable defenses, but in every court case, they never looked at a single fact of the case. Mm. They never looked at a piece of evidence. They didn't look at the documents. They have every single government department has refused to look at any of the facts in the case. Okay. So I sued them in the administrative court. I went to the Administrative Sup uh, Supreme Court. They threw it out. Um, I went to, I filed appeals with the criminal authorities, the public prosecutor. I filed three different appeals to charge the government with Holocaust denial. Uh, all three were refused. Um, the status of my case now is we are in the civil courts. We've gone through the lower court. It was thrown out. The it We went through the appeals court. They threw it out. And I have one case left in Lithuania, the civil Supreme Court. Um, and then we will have been through every government department, court, uh, authority that could possibly be attached to this. And Lithuania will not address the facts of the matter and in one of the in in, in 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 one of the cases, the government said to me, "We've done all of our research. In everything we've done, we don't acknowledge uh, Noreka knew nothing. He saw nothing. He heard nothing. Tens of thousands of Jews were being murdered around him, under his command, and he was completely unaware." So they said, well, if you don't like what we're saying, do your own research. So I said, fine. I went ahead. I hired an American uh, PhD based in Lithuania and a second academic to do the research. We actually found about 100 documents that prove conclusively that Noreka was a mass genocidal murderer. Um, and then we were, uh, we were pursuing the case. Um, before, before, before you go on, I just have a, a quick question. So uh, you said you started with Jonas and Noreka uh, 2011. Your court cases are going up until now. So it's been almost 10 years of court cases that you've had with Lithuania. Just to kind of put this all in context, um, uh, in Europe, in Eastern European countries, there, there had been an ongoing trend in other countries to pass these so-called Holocaust laws. I believe starting in 2010, um, I, I think Hungary, Latvia had done in Ukraine. Did you, were you aware of this kind of um, trend happening in Eastern Europe while you were pursuing your research and your court cases? I, I was aware of it peripherally. I've, I have focused entirely on Lithuania. I have not reviewed the other countries, but I know what's going on in some of the other countries. And look, the, the Americans went into Germany right after the war and they did what was called denazification. And Germany had no, no ability to, to really lie anymore. The judges in Germany were still Nazis. It went on for, for decades. It was only 
in the really the late 80s that Germany truly started coming clean. Um, the Lithuanian, the Eastern European countries were occupied by the Soviet Union and all discourse was shut down. So it was only upon liberation in 1990 that they were able to start discussing. And as Sylvia will, will be able to tell you, they needed heroes. They, they, they needed to build the narrative of the country in order to coalesce the people to, for nation building. So they made heroes. And having murdered Jews was no impediment to being a hero. Um, because the Jews were all dead. Um, nobody was going to come back. Nobody needed to tell the truth. They could cleanse the nation, revise the history, and it could be this gleaming story presented to the whole world of, of major heroism without having to, to address any culpability. So this was all quite deliberate. Um, they never thought anybody would, you know, he has this, this troublesome Jew that's asking questions. Who in their right mind would think that somebody's going to come from the United States 75 years after the events and start asking questions when they don't speak the language, they haven't lived there, they, uh, I mean, it's, it's a very remote possibility. They didn't expect this. And so they still don't know how to deal with it. And they've never given themselves a path to tell the truth. In fact, what they've done with all of these court cases is they've backed themselves into such a corner that for them to now tell the truth is actually quite impossible. Uh, it's, it's a problem that they have. We know who murdered our families. Our families are dead. They're not coming back. And all we can ask for is tell the truth about who did the murderers, who did the murders. So, you know, introducing Sylvia, um, I knew who Sylvia was. I had trolled Sylvia and I had read some of her writing and I thought this is one horrible woman. She had written articles about this great hero uh, Jonas Noreka, that was this glorious warrior for Lithuania that wouldn't have hurt uh, a butterfly. Um, and I thought, you know what, I, I just don't, this woman is, it's not her fault. Uh, I don't believe in generational guilt. It was her grandfather that did it, uh, not her. So I didn't make contact with her. I, I didn't I, I didn't pursue her any further and I'm deep in all of these lawsuits it's consuming unbelievable amounts of my time and one day I'm sitting at my desk at work and I've told Sylvia the story before and this email pops up on on my computer and it says hello Mr. Goshen my name is Sylvia Foti I assume you know who I am and my hands, my hands started shaking like this. And I started, I broke out into a sweat. My, I started having palpitations. I, I, I cannot tell you the, the physical reaction I had to this. And she says, so she says, I assume you know who I am. And I would like to talk to you, please. If you're willing to talk to me, uh, like, would, would you talk to me? And I was just sitting there in absolute shock. The phone was ringing, the emails were coming. I was just, I was just sitting my, just this. And so I replied to her and I said, you know what? I need some time um, because I needed to, to, to take myself down a few notches to, to be able to talk to her. And we set up a time uh, a few days later. And I thought, you know what? I'm really gonna spend a penny on dialing this woman she can call me. So the phone rings and she says, hello, Mr. Goshen. And I'm like, yeah. She says, I've read all of your research because I made all of my research public. 
So I said, yes. She says, um, I want to tell you that I agree with all of your research, except you've made one big mistake. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, yeah, what mistake are you going to tell me I made? So I said, what? She said, you've missed approximately 10,000 of my grandfather's victims. And like that, all the defenses went down. And then she says to me, I've been researching my grandfather for 20 years. So her, her horrible articles that she had written were before she started doing the research. She says, I've been researching my grandfather for 20 years. She said, and I've written a book. Would you like to read it? So I was like, yeah, I'd be very interested to read it. Still very suspicious of who she is and, and why she's contacting me. And so she emailed me her book and I sat down on the sofa in my living room and I started reading and I did not get up from the sofa until I'd finished reading her book. And by the time I finished reading her book, every defense had been removed. Um, she went in as an investigative journalist and peeled back the layers one by one by one. She has devastatingly exposed Lithuania's Holocaust denial strategy. Um, Sylvia, do you want to yeah, take I'm a say, I'm going to say, Sylvia, why don't you kind of jump in and, and tell us how, how did you get started with this? I mean, Grant kind of brought us up to how you two had interacted and connected, but fill us in on that road for you getting to that point. Sure. Um, you, you know, I was born in Chicago and uh, my parents came here as children. Uh, my father left. Uh, he was nine years old. My mother was four years old. So they met they met here in Chicago. And, but they, like all good Lithuanians, you know, they were very nationalistic and they raised my brother and me in the language of Lithuanian. And I went to kindergarten, not even speaking English yet. And uh Throughout my childhood and my teenage years, I always heard about my grandfather, Jonas Pareko, what a wonderful World War II hero he was. And uh, my grandmother spoke about him as well, his wife, my mother's mother. And, um, you know, I, he, he was this amazing person and had accomplished so much for the good of Lithuania. And I was just so proud of him. Um, in 1941, he led an uprising against the communists, uh, this five-day uprising, he was, and he won. They won. And then during the Nazi occupation, he was appointed as chief district of Shaole. And he did this as a nationalist to take care of the Lithuanians while he was working for the Nazis, but he was really this anti-Nazi all along the way. And because he was such a fervent anti-Nazi, they sent him to the Stutthof concentration camp for two years, where he was tortured and treated horribly. And then uh, when the Soviets won the war, um, he was released. And then he um, got cons conscripted by the Russians to join the Russian army. Uh, and then after that, he went back to Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania, and he formed another rebellion against the communists. And now it's 1946, but the KGB caught him and the KGB brought him to prison and they tortured him and they executed him. They shot him in the head and he was just 36 years old. And he left behind a wife and a daughter, who was my mother and my grandmother. And um, my mother in the 1970s had been asked to write a biography of her wonderful father. And so she had started to collect all kinds of material on him. So since the 1970s, um, I've been you know, uh, watching my mother collect material on this major hero, uh, not just in my family, but in a, in a nation. And um, 
you know, at this time, the country was still occupied by the communists. So, so the whole Lithuanian community is just devastated and still struggling, you know, the loss of our homeland and, you know, they killed my grandfather. Um, so, so, um, my mother was working on this book, uh, in the year 2000, she got sick again. Uh, she had always been struggling with diabetes and back pain and she was 60 years old and she landed in the hospital again. And I thought it was another routine thing. She had been in the hospital like, you know, once every two years it seemed for something or other. And she always came out, you know, and everything would be fine. But I went to visit her and she looked really bad. She looked really, really bad. And I was very concerned. Um, and I came to her and she took my hand and she said, Sylvia, you have to write the book. And, uh, of course I, it was crystal clear what book she was talking about. Um, and you know, I said, no, 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 no. You're, you're going to come out of the hospital and you're going to be fine. You're going to, you're going to, you know, finish this book. This is your life's work. And she said, promise me you have to do it. Everybody's expecting this book. And so I'm holding her hand and I'm looking out the window and it's a cold January day in Chicago. It's snowing. I think there was a foot of snow. And I'm just staring out the window and I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, and then I made a deal with God. And I said, um, how about I say yes, but she's going to be okay. And she's still going to write the book. Deal? Deal. Well, you know how these deals go with God. So... Uh, I said yes to her and she closed her eyes and um, fell asleep and then I went back home and then I came back the next day to visit her and she was in a coma hmm. and within two weeks she had died. So of course I was, uh, it was a surprise. It was a shock to all of us. Uh, we, we, we didn't really, she was only 60 years old. I expected her to live at least another 20 years. Um, so I, I was grieving. Um, and um, slowly, 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 I uh, went back to the house where I grew up. She had converted my old bedroom into her studio and had uh, started to slowly bring over the material that she had collected on him. And for me, this was a, a really nice process. By this point, I was thinking, you know, I'm missing my mother. Maybe this is a nice way to kind of connect with her. I'm going to get to know my grandfather better. I'm going to help Lithuania. Uh, I'm going to reconnect with my roots. So, so I was beginning to embrace this project. And... Um, and she had just brought over so much material, uh, you know, 3,000 pages of KGB transcripts um, from when my grandfather was interrogated by the KGB. Say what you will about the Soviets, they record everything. And so that was just a big treasure load. Um, when he was in Schudhoff, he wrote 77 letters to my grandmother. Beautiful love letters. And he wrote a fairy tale to my mother, gorgeous fairy tale. And just, you know, all kinds of articles uh, from magazines and newspapers that um, had been written about my grandfather. So um, I brought everything over. It's all right here behind me now. And um, I started, you know, kind of going through it. And, um, so now it's July 2000, and my grand. So, so, so can I ask you a quick question before you? Yes, before you, of course. So, so at what point in your life was the first mention of the book? 1970s. And, and then, and so you kind of fast forwarded to, to 2000. 
or so when your your mother or was your grandmother or your mother who was getting sick? My mother. Your mother. His so, daughter. So a bit between the the 70s and and 2000, uh, a lot happened in the world, and uh, you know, the Soviet Union collapsed. What was your relationship with, if I just, before you kind of go on to your personal story, what was your personal relationship with, with Lithuania? Had you gone to Lithuania at that period of time? Had you had any reaction? No, um, I never, I never, I, you know, I went to Saturday school, uh, Lithuanian Saturday school. I was in a lot of Lithuanian organizations. I went to Lithuanian summer camps in Michigan here uh, in Vermont. But you had a positive, um, but you had a positive uh perception of a grandfather. You had, you had this positive Everywhere, story. everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And, and, and then after the and after the Soviet Union collapsed, had you gone to, did you go to Lithuania? I, my mom went, uh, I went there in uh, 89 and then uh, 97. And I went with my mom because she was an opera singer and she uh, was singing concerts there for them already. And, um, and she was, collecting material for her book. So, you know, I was kind of like tagging along and, you know, getting to know my heritage homeland. And and, and how were you treated by the Lithuanian government? Were you welcomed as? as oh, as, very much so. Very much so. Very warmly. Um, you know, uh, the granddaughter of Jonas Noreka was treated very well. Okay. That's what I wanted to understand. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, so now uh, we're in July 2000, and my grandmother um, had another heart attack. This was like her fourth, fifth one. She was in her 80s already, and I went to visit her, and um, she she had survived my mother by by five months. And of course, she was devastated that my, you know her daughter had died. Um, but anyway, she, I, I come visit her, and how are you doing? What should I, you know? How are things? And um, she looked at me and said, how's the book? <laughs> and I said, uh, it's going, you know, I'm, I'm going to get through it. I was 38 years old at the time. And I said, I'm young. I'm going to get it done. Don't worry. I'm not going to let it go like mom did. You know, don't worry. It's, I'm going to do it. And she took my hand and she said, don't write the book. And I said, what? She said, just let history lie. There, there's no need to dig around in there. And and I said, what are you saying? I already promised mom. I, you know, I have to do this. I, of course I'm going to write the book. And she um, did not like my answer. And so she just turned over. She was in bed and she just turned over and faced the wall and kind of turned her back to me. And I said, uh, goodbye. And um, then I came back, you know, about, about a week later. And by this point, uh, she was in a coma. And then she died. And uh, both of them, my mother and my grandmother, had asked uh, to be buried in Lithuania. And so my brother and I, uh, they, they they were cremated. So my brother and I took their cremains to Lithuania in October 2000. And we buried them. And a lot of people came to visit the relatives of Jonas Nureka, Aka General Storm. His code name was General Storm. And, um, and then after that, uh, <laughs> my brother and I were invited to visit the school named after my grandfather. It's the Jonas Nareka, Grand, uh, Jonas Nareka Grammar School in Shukone, which is in northern Lithuania. And um, we are uh, greeted, you know, all the children are, are holding flowers and they're singing, you know, the Lithuanian song. And, um, you know, we're just greeted so warmly. And, you know, I, I, I was just so touched by the whole thing. And, and then the director uh, brings us to his office and all the teachers are standing around and, you know, saying hello and we're getting to know them. And then the director brings me over to see this big scrapbook about my grandfather and I'm kind of like leafing through the pages. And he said, you know, I heard you're writing the book. I said, yes, 
He said, you're a good daughter to take this project over from your mother. I said, thank you. He said, yes, our, our country needs heroes. So you, it's very, very important that you're writing this book and I'm so pleased that you're doing it. And, um, and I said, you know, as long as I'm here, why don't you tell me uh, how you named the school after my grandfather? And he said, well, you know, before it was this horrible Russian name and we had to get rid of that terrible name and we had to give it a good Lithuanian name. And um, your grandfather was born in this town. So his name came up right away and it was a natural. And I said, okay, I, th that makes a lot of sense. And I thought that would be the end of the story. And then he takes me and my brother kind of to the side and he says, but you know, I got a lot of grief over naming the school after your grandfather. And I said, what do you mean you got a lot of grief? He said, because of what the Jews were saying. And I said, what could the Jews possibly say about my grandfather? And he looked at me like I'm the one from Mars. And he said, well, he was accused of killing Jews. And I, and I said, what? And I just, I, I uh, almost went into shock and my heart was racing and, you know, I, I just, I almost fainted. I, they, they had to give me a seat and I'm sitting down and the director's like, but don't worry, don't worry. It's, you know, that's in the past. Uh, all of that is over now. So um, it's okay. It's okay. So he's trying to soothe me and, and I'm like trying to, you know, I'm drinking a glass of water and like, trying to get back into it and um then I you know I, I came back to Chicago and I started asking my relatives my friends did you hear the story about Jonas Nareka killing Jews and I was shocked how many of them had heard this and I said how come nobody ever told me anything about this well it's just communist propaganda why would anybody talk about this with you and I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah, it's just a made up story. You don't have to believe it. You know, the communists, they just, you know, they're upset Lithuania has its independence and it's a free country again. And they don't want, they don't want Lithuania to have their heroes to build a nation. So they're just making this up. And I thought, oh, okay. So, um, so I very slowly, slowly started my research kind of relieved that uh, this is not a true story. And, um, you know, I, I was doing this on the side. I was still, I was still a working journalist and uh, I had two young children then. And so this was a very, very slow thing for me. Um, but it was always there at the back of my head. Some, you know, like at some point I thought, I'm going to exonerate him. I'm going to prove how innocent he is. What a good man he was. That, that This is just crazy. It's not true. And I'm going to make that part of my story. So I had gotten to that point because I knew I couldn't ignore it. As a journalist, I just couldn't completely ignore it. So I knew I had to address it somehow. And the way I was going to address it was to prove it wrong. And um, so anyway, about 10 years passed. And I had gotten through a lot of the material. And um, it was uh, at about the 10 year mark where I came across this brochure that my grandfather had written. And it was hidden in, in like in between these unlikely other documents, you know, as, as if like it didn't belong where it was. It wasn't where it, like I thought it might have belonged. So, what, what year is this? How? What year is this? That that I, I found this brochure in 2010. Okay, so right, right about when Grant is about to start his uh, his lawsuits. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I, I I went through ten years of all his good stuff. I went through the KGB transcripts. I translated his fairy tale. I went through the beautiful love letters. So I went through, I went through all the heroic stuff. And um. And uh, so anyway, this brochure is called "Raise Your Head, Lithuanian." And it was written in 1933, and he had already been part of the army, the Lithuanian army, and uh, it was 32 pages, and it was basically a rant against 
the foreigners in Lithuania, how they took over the whole country and how Lithuanians need to get Lithuania back for Lithuanians. And these foreigners are of course the Jews. And uh, it's not fair, they took over the businesses, uh, they have all the money, they have all the professions. Uh, we need to stop buying any products from Jews. Uh, we need to you know, support only Lithuanians. If you have a choice to buy a product from a Jew or Lithuanian, please don't buy it from the Jew, buy it from the Lithuanian. So this, is like, great, this is your grandfather. Where, where yeah, this is my grandfather. And how old was he when he wrote this? Do you know? 22. At age 22, wow. And, and Rabbi Egger, just, just when, we, when we hear that that kind of content is, is created in Lithuania by, by a 22 year old Lithuanian, right. I mean, it really echoes across all aspects of, of the lead up to the Holocaust, right? Right, it's exactly what we what we hear from others, other countries, other stories, uh, and what we've con sadly continued to hear today, uh, both the right and the left today. Uh, look at what's been going on on Twitter just in this last uh, last uh, two days with uh, certain people in Britain and rappers and same kind of uh, information, same kind of, of of lies. Sorry, Sylvia, go ahead. No, that's fine. Um, so um, that that was my first sort of turning point, where I thought, uh, okay, this is terrible. Uh, uh, this is going to make it really difficult for me to exonerate him now. And as his granddaughter, I wanted to burn the thing and just get rid of the ev evidence. Uh, but the journalist in me um, didn't, and so I held on to it. And I and but that was where I really sort of said. Okay, now I have to I have to really dig here, and so um, from that was sort of the beginning of the story, and then from there I started finding more and more and more, and was becoming more and more devastated. And tell us how you how you from your perspective came to know Grant, um, but and, and, not, and by no Grant I mean just. When you first became aware of him to actually meeting him, what, what was that process for you? Okay, so it took me um, another eight years. Well, I had gone to Lithuania and I did my own research and I talked to you know a lot of experts there and historians and family members and I pieced his whole as much of his life together as I could. And then it still took me another five years because again I'm still doing this on the side. Uh, so 2018, the book is finally finished, and I need an agent. I need I need to find a literary agent because my goal was to get this published by a real publisher. Like I didn't want to self-publish, and um, so they so everybody you know I, I I I found out that I have to get what is called an author platform. I'm like okay, so it wasn't enough that I wrote a book. No. So then they said, so then I was advised to create a website. So I created this website uh, and within the website I put up finally by March, 2018. And um, literally within days, maybe one or two days, uh, this researcher from Lithuania, PhD, who was an American, whose name is uh, Andrus Kulikauskas, sends me an email and he says, uh, I am a researcher working for a man by the name of Grant Goshen and uh, he is launching a lawsuit against the Genocide Center about your grandfather. And I almost fell off my chair. And I said, what? You gotta be kidding me. What? What is this? You know, I, I thought I had like this little tiny family story. I mean, I knew it was going to be big, like with Lithuanians and stuff, but I, you know, a lawsuit. And then, and then Andrew says, you should meet Grant. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And uh, so it took me six weeks to gather my courage. Um, to contact Grant because I thought he's gonna, you know, he's Jewish and he's gonna hate me. My grandfather, you know, killed Jews in, in Lithuania. What is what does he want to do with me? Why is Andres making me do this? You know, and um, 
But then I finally, you know, I, I, I finally decided that who am I writing this book for if it's not for people like Grant? And, and, to be, and to be clear, at this point, you had done your research. You had found the comprehensive evidence beyond the pamphlet. You found other things that clarified for you, at least, what your grandfather's role in role was with the with Jews in Lithuania. Yeah, I found a lot, a lot, a lot. I found. I mean, the book was done. The okay. book was pretty much the book. The book was done. So you know, I'm ready to find a literary agent, and I'm ready to publish this. And that was all I thought I was going to do. Yeah. But um, now, but now you're carrying, and you as the granddaughter, you're carrying this history that you know is true because you've seen the research, you've seen the records. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, so, so I, Grant, well, I, I'm curious though, like, so now, so, so you had this like powerful first meeting, Grant read your book about your grandfather. You had put so much Sylvia into this book to, to try and figure out this story that you didn't know, right. That had been really hidden from you, even though others in your family. Now this is 2022 years later. And the two of you have done such work together to try and uncover truth. Um, that's what you did with your book with your grandfather, Grant. That's what you've been trying to do and holding the Lithuanian government accountable. How has your relationship together over this course of time um, affected, affected two of you? Like, I, I'm curious about, you know, you started... Both of you just said you were both scared to kind of interact with other, and now your work is parallel to each other. Sylvia, do you want to answer first? Sure. Um, you know, uh, from that first phone conversation, which, by the way, was on April 20th, and wow. I don't know if anybody in the audience understands the significance of April 20th and the irony of April 20th and the, and the fact that Grant and I first connected on April 20th. April 20th is Hitler's birthday. So um, since then, uh, we have been pretty much in daily contact. Um, you know, until that moment, I was so isolated and so alone and, you know, just carrying this entire load, psychological load, uh, all by myself and um, terrified and worried and stressed and uh, just overloaded. And I, yeah, and strangely um when i connected with grant it's like everything was cut in half uh, the the emotional load was cut in half because now i could share it and he had the you know in, in a in a weird way because of his lawsuits he had the exact sort of same mission that i did and strangely me trying to write the book and him trying to um have these lawsuits uh, finished, we found each other like on the exact same side doing the exact same thing. And, and, you know, I shared my research with him and he shared his research with me. And then he uh, generously offered to uh, put all his research on my website, um, saying that, you know, since I'm the granddaughter, it'll have a better effect. And um, and so we just we just started sharing everything together like that, and then um, and then I knew that I had to um, get a story out. To, to and really, I'm still like worried about attracting a literary age. That's that was my only goal at that point. Um, and you know, for this author platform that that we authors have to get now, and so like I I finally got an article out and, and now Grant was part of the story because I met him in April and that article came out in July and already the, 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 the story's changing because of Grant. And now like, it's like this combination of forces working together. Uh, and when that story came out on salon.com, everything exploded. 
from that moment on, everything exploded. So, so, so let me answer this from my perspective. Yes, please. I've been banging this drum for three decades and I've been in complete isolation. I was one man banging a drum on his own, uh, attracting no attention. And um, I had no outside support. I, I, until Dylan stepped up, uh, Dylan's the first institutional support that I've had. And he really has, he's done a remarkable job in, in taking us to the next level. Um, and then Sylvia contacted me. Before Sylvia contacted me, it was a non-story. When Sylvia contacted me, it was the granddaughter of the murderer standing next to the grandson of some of his victims, both coming up with the same conclusion, both pointing a finger at the Lithuanian government as outright Holocaust revisionists, um, when Sylvia told me you've missed 10,000 of my grandfather's victims, my defenses crumbled. When I read her book, every defense crumbled. It's, it's, uh, I cannot wait for this book to come out. It is, it, it is an absolute revelation. Uh, Sylvia said to me when, when I spoke to her, she said, I think this is the, the greatest cover-up of the 20th century. Mm. What Sylvia didn't know at that time was, mm. I think I have a dozen genocidal mass murderers on my list that, that Lithuania's made international heroes. It's so common that I actually asked the question, uh, was murdering Jews a criteria for, for Lithuanian national honours? Um, and when Sylvia crumbled my defenses and I finally had somebody next to me that understood, that saw the data and understood the pain, I will tell you that Sylvia and I have become such close friends. We talk all the time. We have... I mean, the commonality is just unbelievable. If you consider that her family and my family started in the same shtetl 100 years ago, and now her brother's in Los Angeles and I'm in Los Angeles, I mean, the family started in the same place, ended in the same place, and in between, her family murdered all of mine. So, I mean, right. what a journey. But we've right. become really good, close, trusting, good friends. And... We're a team now, and it's after 30 years, uh, I have a team, and it's, it's a really good feeling. So, so it, also sorry. Speaks, it also Good. speaks to the idea that we have to, the, the speaking truth to power, which is what both of you are doing. And in particular, with this notion, with the Holocaust denial that's just rampant, um, as, we not, as, we, as, you're, as you've uncovered in Lithuania. But it's happening, uh, you know, neighboring Poland and Hungary. It's happening all over again. Yes. Uh, even as Germany had made so many strides towards reconciliation and programs of that, it's creeping up again there. This, and it's certainly creeping up here in the United States. What do we? What? what how else can we learn from the work that the two of you have done, uh, and are doing, and continuing to do as the lawsuits are still happening, Grant, to combat? this twisting of the truth of what happened. Is there something that you can tell all of us who are here tonight um, how, to, how to engage in that fight with you? You know, it's, it, it's interesting, Rabbi, you were a warrior for gay rights like very few others in the world. And there were a number of people that brought about equality. What Sylvia's and my story shows is that one person can take on an entire government. And if a person is passionate enough, then they can bring truth 
to power. So the amount of fact revisionism that's going on in our country now, throughout the world, you know, we, we have to be vigilant. When, when you have something like Holocaust denial or, or denial of, of human rights violations, if truth isn't told, it can lead into a repeat. You, first of all, you denying the, the victimhood of the victims, you, you denying, you denying the entire factual basis of, of, of what happened, and you are laying the groundwork for a repeat scenario. There are so many genocides happening in the world today, and you don't see them in the news. And much of that is, is because governments have so successfully covered up previous genocides. If you look at the genocide of the Armenians in 1915, Adolf Hitler said, who remembers the Armenians? So if nobody remembers killing all the Armenians, we can kill all the Jews. If, 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 if nobody knows that the Uyghurs in China are, are, are being genocided, you know, China can continue along their merry path. Um, we have to. We, we have to expose the facts about history, about current events, and learn the lessons so they're not repeated. Otherwise, we'll never be able to progress in society. And so, Grant, can you can you talk specifically about how you you've done that, um, and, and how you know, even even together how we've done that? Um, uh, uh, I think Sylvia, the first time you and I met, do you remember where it was? I don't remember when it was. Was it a year ago? A little over a year ago, I guess. Yeah, the summer where, of 2019. And where was it? Do you remember? Hollywood. West Hollywood. West yes. Hollywood, West That's Hollywood, right? Yes, West Hollywood City Hall. That's and right. You were, and, and you were honored by the uh, city council there for your work. And from our standpoint, that was a, a great way to get an important city like West Hollywood, which, which was our audience here tonight, to become aware of this issue, um, not not just for historical purposes, but for future purposes. Grant, as you said, genocide is happening around the world. Anti-Semitism is on the rise. If government crimes are allowed to persist and not uh, and to be covered up without question, in the past, it's, it sets the, the same um, uh, uh, precedent for the future. Um, and Grant, you've been honored by um, other cities as well, I think, in America. Can, can you list them off the top of your head? Um, the, the, the most recent was the city of Beverly Hills. It's an important um, city. And it's a big city. It's an important city. Um, and Los the city Los of Angeles. Beverly Hills passed a resolution condemning Lithuania for, for Holocaust revisionism. Um, in fact, there have been, Sylvia's and my work has been brought to the attention. Sylvia's first article in, in salon.com really made a huge international impact. Um, we've, both of us have faced horrible intimidation from the Lithuanian government as, as a result. Um, we've both faced incredible hostility, um, but I think we both have broad shoulders and we can sustain it. So when, when a city like West Hollywood honors Sylvia, it, it shows that a city like West Hollywood is standing up for the values of civil rights, freedom and equality. When a country like Lithuania is taking the murderer of about 14 and a half thousand Jews and saying, well, this is our national hero. You know, let's, let's ask the question. If, if some Russian came into Lithuania tomorrow and murdered 14 and a half thousand Lithuanians, would Lithuania honor them as a national hero? So, so clearly, so clearly it's about them being Jews. Um, you know, when, 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 a country displays these kind of values and says, okay, our Jewish citizens or our gay citizens are dispensable and we can kill them, and that doesn't stop the heroization process. It's reflective of, of national values. Now, I absolutely do not want to impugn ordinary Lithuanians. The, the majority of Lithuanians are really decent, fine people, 
that, that are horrified by what is being done in their name, that they would love to see this all come to an end, these honors revoked, truth be told. But the intimidation that, that, that Sylvia and I have faced, um, the full strength of the Lithuanian government coming against us, you know, ordinary Lithuanians face it as well. So if Lithuanians, ordinary Lithuanians speak out, uh, a friend of mine was fired for from his job um, on the city of Vilnius for saying, "Well, we should look at this honestly." I mean, he he didn't even he didn't go into specifics, um, and for making that statement, he was fired. Um, ordinary Lithuanians are intimidated as well, so we cannot blame ordinary Lithuanians. Um, like I said, most of them are, are really decent people. So, so we are um, uh, a bit past the top of the hour, and um, I, I, as usual, we've uh, we, we've actually kept a pretty good audience and um, and uh, kept the, the story moving. But I want to kind of um, start to think about um, uh, what do we hope to see happen. And I, I, I Rabbi, I want to keep and, and be cognizant of our time and, and the time for the program tonight. Um, but I just want to, uh, you know, we. Grant, you mentioned Beverly Hills, being honored by Beverly Hills, and, and Sylvia honored by the uh, city of West Hollywood. I think also the city of Los Angeles. So many cities have, have honored um, yes. the work that you all have done. Um, I want to pull up, if I can, um, a recent um, uh, comment from the State Department, just to kind of close this out here, um, just to kind of show the practical effect of the work that you um, of the work that you have done here. So let's see if I can. Uh, I can pull this up here. One second. No, that's not the right one. Hold on, guys. One second. Uh, okay. Let's do this one. All right. And so you can you can see this now. Um, so this is uh, Sherry Daniels um, from the U.S. State Department, uh, who is quoted as saying, and this is by the way, this is not old. <laughs> this is new. This is no, to, last this week or the week before. Last week. Yeah. Yeah. Last week, yeah. She says, uh, quote, this is a call to action to stand up against rehabilitation of those who participated directly or indirectly in the crimes of the Holocaust or genocide of the Roma. Um, and again, this is Sherry Daniels. Um, she's a special envoy for Holocaust issues at the U.S. Uh, Department of State. Um, Grant, Grant and Sylvia, uh, when you see this, um, it, it, bearing in mind the work that you have done and the recent work that you have done to really raise awareness over the past year, how does this make you feel? What does this evoke for you? Um, okay, so the IHRA is the most authoritative body in the world on Holocaust issues. It's, it's an association of governments. And they've only issued three proclamations in the history of, of the organization, and this is one of them. So this is beyond relevant. Um, the IHRA uh, last year or the year before came out with a statement condemning the Lithuanian government for, for Holocaust revisionism, particularly on, on Sylvia's grandfather. Um, during the process of exposing Sylvia's grandfather and, and what the Lithuanian government has done, we've also exposed how they misused um, US congressional documents to revise Holocaust history on, on, on other Holocaust perpetrators. When you see things like this, it cannot be more validating. Um, they didn't mention Lithuania in this, but it is clear to everybody in the world that is aware of this, that Lithuania was a focal point of this resolution. Um, what Sylvia and I have managed to do is to bring a full-scale government agenda to the world's attention. And even though I don't believe I will ever succeed in, in achieving truth in Lithuania, the world now knows who murdered my relatives, how it was done, and the government of Lithuania has been identified for their value statement. 
and, and I think uh, just just to really highlight here, it says this is a call to action. So Sylvia, yes. how do, how does that make you feel about this? Is the this is a uh, an official of the U.S. Department of State basically saying we need to keep going on this? You know, um, I I am just so amazed and even overwhelmed uh, emotionally because I really just did this as a promise to my mother to write this story. And that's all I meant to do was to keep my promise. And uh, for it to have grown to, 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 to this level, um, you know, to me, uh, you know, I'm a practicing Catholic and I, and I believe in God. And I, I, you know, I just have to say that there is a guiding hand in this. There is an invisible force that wants this to come out. And I believe that it will. It, this just gives me so much hope that it really will. All right, so um, go ahead, go ahead, Robert. No, I was just gonna say, you know, and, and what we're, the two of you have joined forces to speak this truth to power uh, uh, who, who are actively engaged in trying to snuff out the truth of history. And what happened, and not only to the Jews, but to all of the other different groups that were singled out in, you know, in, in Nazi Europe, right? Whether it was the Jews or the Roma or those with disabilities. And it is so important, for, as you said, Grant, to learn the lessons for the times we're living on. Because if we sure. only, only cover up the past, we are doomed to repeat it. And we, we've seen that happen time and again already since World War II. And we need to take note of what's going on in our current world right here and now in 2020, as you point out, not only in China, but perhaps there's some things going on and right here under our own noses with children Absolutely. still in cages and uh, uh, accusations against different groups and pitting one uh, ethnic group or racial group against another. So, so the work the two of you are doing while it is focused on Lithuania and the horrors that happened there in the time of World War II, um, and focused in, as you said, Grant, on understanding this relationship between Sylvia's relatives and your relatives, it is really a story that is much bigger than yes. one, one, two families or one country. And uh, we're so appreciative of the work that you're doing and, and how you're teaching us to really to speak this truth and to, to give voice to the pain the pain that it must cause you, Sylvia, to realize this was your family and the pain, Grant, as we've known each other for many, many years now together, the pain I know of the loss that you have and the traumas that were passed on to you um, by the suffering in your families. Um, but to now find healing in each other is, is actually a message of hope uh, for all of us. And so we're so grateful and thankful for the work and hope that the strength that you find in each other um, will be strengthened by uh, your continued work together and that we can join forces to help you in this process. Thank you, Reva. So, so why don't we, we go ahead and, and close it out. Um, I, I do want to make a, a quick comment, uh, Rabbi Egger, um, one of your um, congregants, John D'Amico, former mayor of West Hollywood, current, current immediate past former uh, mayor of uh, West Hollywood and uh, current city council member, uh, sent me a note and he has been watching and he is fascinated by the story and, and thanks you Grant and Sylvia for um, for sharing your story. Um, I, I do want to um, make a, a quick note here. Uh, da uh, let's see here. Dale uh, Apple had asked, is there anything we can do to help? So what I want to do is I want to go ahead and um, share with you very quickly as we close out here um, and, and we let uh, Rabbi Chaikin and um, Rabbi Edgar continue the Tisha B'Av uh, here. Um, so we have a, uh, since our last event, we have set up a landing page. So I want you, um, all, all of the viewers here, you can, you can see this at IsraelUSA.org uh, forward slash Holocaust. Um, we talk about Lithuania, we emphasize Lithuania here. As we mentioned earlier in the um, in the program, uh, there has been a trend historically over the past 10 years of Eastern European governments seeking to revise history for various reasons. We highlight uh, uh, Grant and Sylvia here. Um, on this page, you'll also see our, our council of advisors that we have put together. Um, 
we're always welcoming more. So if, if there's interest, uh, um, please reach out to us and we'd be happy to, to expand this Council of Advisors on the Prevention of Holocaust Denial and Distortion. Um, please sign up, um, subscribe and stay informed uh, about European uh, Holocaust Denial. Um, and here you'll be able to see a recording of, of tonight's event. And most importantly, and, and, and Grant wouldn't uh, let me go without saying this, um, all of the work that we do costs money at, at, here at ICANN, and if, you're, if you are able to support us, uh, please visit this page. There is a, a campaign set up here. Um, any amount uh, helps. Um, so as we say here, never again is now, and, um, and your support will be um, generously uh, um, received and, and very grateful. Uh, May support. I say something to Lynn, please? Yes, yes absolutely. ICANN was... In, in, in 30 years of standing up against the Lithuanian government, ICANN is the first institution that has come to my assistance. Dylan's work has taken this to a whole new level. I want to publicly acknowledge uh, ICANN and the work of Dylan Hozier and encourage you to support him. I'd also like to say Sylvia's book is coming out in May 2021, and it's compelling. Um, if I tell you that, you know, even if it wasn't about the subject that I'm that passionate about, I would have sat down and still read it cover to cover in one sitting. She is a phenomenal author, and that is going to be an extraordinary book. So when, when it's issued, I encourage you to read it. Okay, Sylvia, you're coming back. We're doing a book interview when the book comes out. Awesome, okay? thank you. Okay, we're going to definitely do that together because there's more to the story than we yes. can share with all of you tonight and more that we can do to join together with forces and, and support the work that Grant and Sylvia are doing and, and um, understand how uh, the distortion of truth is uh, something that is uh, a, a serious, serious issue, particularly when it comes to Holocaust denial. And, and uh, Rabbi, thank, thank you, you so much. much for giving. Thank you so much for giving us this platform and uh, allowing us to tell our story. If if people don't know, countries like Lithuania will get away with it. And and so thank you to to you and to Kola me um, for allowing us to tell the story. We we are proud of the work that you do, Grant and uh, Sylvia, and uh, we always enjoy partnering with ICANN and Dylan's work. Um, because this is really important. Um, I took a group to Poland last year, last summer. Um, we uh, met with uh, LGBTQ activists in Poland. We met with Jewish community in Poland. We met, and uh, we, we can see what's already, what's creeping and happening there as well with the same kind of story, Sylvia, that you share about your grandfather. Uh, the denial there is as big as well and continues to be. And so uh, it's something that uh, we see here in our own country, we, in the United States, we see it happening in Europe, and uh, we, we together, I know, will uh, continue to speak truth to power. We're going to close uh, our evening, uh, since it is the 9th of Av, this day of remembering uh, communal tragedy. Uh, even as we end, uh, we read uh, just a word from the Book of Lamentations uh, in the Bible, which uh, marks the destruction of the first temple. But we think about all of these tragedies that has befallen our people as a way to learn how to be resilient and how to rise up uh, and to be strong once again, which is what your work is teaching us. And the last verses of the book of Lamentation says, because of this, our hearts are sick. Because of this, our eyes are dimmed. Because of Mount Zion, which lies desolate, jackals howl. But you, God, are enthroned forever. Your throne endures through the ages. Why you've forgotten us utterly and forsaken us for time. Take us back, God, to yourself, and let us come back and renew us as our days of old. For truly you rejected us, bitterly raged against us, but you shall take us back, God, to yourself, to let us come back and renew our days of old. We'll close with the song Eli Eli, the words of Hannah Senesh, the pre-Israeli state uh, heroine who... Uh, helped save some of her European siblings and helped parachute in to Holocaust uh, Nazi territory to try and save lives. 
The work you are doing, Grant and Sylvia, is also work of saving lives and saving memories. And we hope that that truth is one of those things that never ends, that we pray for in this prayer. Thank you all for being with us, Grant, Sylvia, Rabbi Chaikin, as always, Dylan. I'm grateful to you at the Israel American Civic Action Network. And join us at Congregation Kolami online, kol-ami.org, uh, for more programs like this of learning and empowerment. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Grant. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.